Thank you, John, and thanks for the opportunity. So I'll attempt uh, in the next 10 minutes or so give a very 30, broad 30,000 view uh, overview of gene therapy, the differences between gene therapy and gene editing, as well as uh, an update on some stem cell work. Uh, these are my disclosures. So generally, when we're talking about gene therapy, we're talking about uh, gene augmentation or gene replacement therapy, and that's the process by which a functional copy of a gene is packaged inside a viral vector, which is then delivered into a patient with an inherited renal disease to replace the dysfunctional broken gene with a functional copy. Um, but one of the problems about inherited renal diseases, first of all, they're mostly orphan diseases. They're not very common. Most of them are classified as retinitis pigmentosa, but with advances in genetic testing, we're beginning to understand that these are all based on clinical uh, presentations, but if you look at the genes that cause it, it turns out that there are dozens of different genes that can cause a single disease, which we call retinitis pigmentosa, or even Stargardt's. And then if you look actually even more complex, some, ge some genes, different mutations within the same gene can give you different diseases, which is one of the challenges, I think, with um, gene therapy development. Now, to understand about gene therapy versus gene editing, it's important to understand the difference between recessive versus dominant mutations. So all of us have two copies of every gene, which can make two copies of protein or copies of functional protein. So if you have a broken version, it, you're still OK, because you can still make functional protein. And usually for a recessive gene, it's only where you have to have both genes mutated in order to have the disease. And in this situation, gene therapy works very well, because you just give a functional copy, and you can rescue the phenotype and actually have a working gene. However, in dominant diseases, essentially you actually have a mutated version of the protein that you only need one version of the gene, the mutation to have the disease because the uh, abnormal mutated protein actually binds to or interacts with the normal version and actually causes that to become damaged as well. So in this case, gene therapy actually doesn't work very well because if you give it another good copy of the gene, that will also be damaged. So as a result, to treat dominant uh, mutations, you usually have to either figure out a way to block that protein from interacting and binding and da damaging your normal protein, or you have to destroy the mutation itself. And to act at that level, to actually change the uh, genome at the DNA level, that requires gene editing, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So whenever you have gene therapy, you start off with a gene, which could be any type of gene that could be mutated in a disease. But you also need a vector to carry it, and then you also need a delivery mode to deliver the vector to the eye. When we talk about vectors, we usually talk about viral vectors, which could be the general characteristics you want is something that express highly for a long time, large capacity hold big genes, low immunogenicity, low risk of mutations. Now, lentivirus, which includes HIV, um, is checks most of those boxes with the exception that it integrates into the host genome, so it actually can potentially have adverse effects, particularly if it integrates into like a tumor suppressor gene and gives you cancer. AAV does not integrate, but it actually has a much smaller carrying capacity. So for genes like the Stargardt gene, ABCA4, it doesn't fit inside an AAV, and that's why that has to be delivered with the lentivirus. Anovirus was used in the past, but has been largely abandoned, mainly because the expression wasn't very long, and also it caused a lot of inflammation. And then there are obviously a lot of polymers and uh, different types of nanoparticles that can be developed to carry genes. Most of them can be engineered to be low, um, relatively safe, but the efficacy is not as strong as viral vectors. Now, after you have the vector, you've got to deliver it to the eye. And usually, we talk about intravitreal versus subretinal. And subretinal injections, the advantage is that you get it right up against the photoreceptors in the RPE. So transduction efficiency is good, but you only create a little bleb with it, so the actual effect is very small. While an intravitreal injection, theoretically, can go all over the eye, but because it's blocked by the what's called the internal limiting membrane, it's actually hard to penetrate the layers of the retina. Um, the other, although we still want to do intravitreal because obviously it's a lot easier, you can do it in the clinic. Um, subretinal injections require complex uh, vitreo retinal surgery. Um, so how do we get around that? So newer generations of AAV are being developed. A lot of them are being designed through a process called directed evolution, where you can actually uh, generate variants of AAV, mutated forms of the capsid that allows some versions to be injected into the eye and intravitreally and still get it to have widespread expression. But the key to note is that a lot of these studies, when you show that it works in mice, doesn't necessarily mean it'll work in a monkey. And when it works in a monkey, doesn't necessarily work in a person. So there are some challenges there as well. 
Another strategy is to use a micro needle to do, deliver it super corridorly, um, and so a needle that can just penetrate the sclera without the retina. And this is actually research from our lab um, at the California National Primate Research Center showing that super corridor delivery can potentially give you a much more widespread expression compared to the very focal um, spot of expression for subretinal injection. Um, so once you've found a gene, a vector, and a delivery, that type of research has really led to the first, as you all know, FDA-approved gene therapy, which is Luxterna, as well as a variety of other um, ongoing gene therapy trials. Um, a majority of these are subretinal, and um, as you can see, with the exception of the Stargardt disease, which is a lentivirus. Um, now, historically, we really think about gene therapy as something for inherited diseases because they're single mutation diseases. Um, however, gene therapy can also be used for degenerative diseases. Now, one of the challenges, beside the fact that it's usually a different age range with inherited disease, you really want the sweet spots in the young people, whereas degenerative diseases usually occur in older adults. The other issue is that degenerative disease usually involves a complex interaction of multiple genetic risk factors interacting with environmental risk factors like age, diet, uh, smoking. Uh, but one common denominator for some of these diseases is VEGF. And in fact, some of the uh, first AAV trials were to express a soluble VEGF receptor, as you know. And while those studies have shown uh, some efficacy in monkeys, they actually didn't work so well um, in clinical trials, um, although those clinical trials are also a little faulty. So I, um, there are uh, multiple ongoing trials using alternative strategies and different um, uh, inclusion criteria. So how about this whole idea of a, something that destroys a mutation? Um, so what exactly is CRISPR? So believe it or not, many of you have probably eaten an apple or a mushroom that has been engineered using CRISPR to eliminate the enzyme that oxidizes iron so that they don't turn brown as quickly. So CRISPR is already here and it's here to stay. Um, and unlike most of our current therapies, we really target things at the protein level like antibodies and uh, receptors and even some treatments that are targeting at the RNA level. CRISPR is, an, is a technology that really targets things at the DNA level, the genomic level. So the potential is an actual permanent cure uh, that stays with you as opposed to a treatment that needs to be repeated. Um, CRISPR is uh, a set of enzymes that are derived from bacterial immune system. They're specialized DNA cutting enzymes that are programmed with RNA. And um, in certain situations, you can program it to hit a specific gene at a specific location. Um, these Technologies have been used in a number of uh, mouse models, primarily of uh, dominant types of retinitis pigmentosa. And actually, our lab has also shown that you can use CRISPR to knock down VEGF from in vitro in human RPE cells, and even in vivo, showing in mouse CNV with about 30 to 40 percent reduction in VEGF expression and CNV development. Last few seconds, I want to transition quickly to stem cells. Gene therapy, really, the sweet spot is in early diseases because you want to really treat the gene before they start having cell death and things start dying. But stem cells have the potential to treat really advanced diseases and any type of disease because you're potentially able to replace dead cells. Stem cells can come from embryos uh, through embryonic stem cells. Um, fetal uh, retina can be used to get retinal progenitors. And you can even get some from adults through bone marrow, fat, and even skin cells, which can be reprogrammed into what are called induced pluripotent stem cells. Now, generally, you don't want to inject completely immature pluripotent stem cells into the body because essentially they can grow into any cell type, which includes cancer. So you want something that's a little bit more um, differentiated. So there are several trials that are using these uh, uh, progenitor cells um, intravitrally. But then, as we mentioned, we can also differentiate stem cells into things like RPE and photoreceptors. And those can be transplanted. The disadvantage of embryonic stem cells is that they come from embryos, so there's some ethical concerns. And because they're allogeneic, um, they require HLA matching. Uh, IPSCs are from somatic cells, so they theoretically could be from your own skin, so it could be an aut autologous transplant, does not require HLA matching, but could also contain the same mutation, the disease-carrying mutation that the patient has, so it doesn't really solve that problem unless you edit that with CRISPR. Um, the last thing is that RPE, uh, certain cell types grow in a sheet, so you can't just inject a whole bunch of RPE cells and expect it to form a, a sheet. So there's definitely a lot of work, and Mark will probably talk more about that, about creating uh, uh, scaffolds or polymers that can let cells grow in a single sheet. 
Um, and then more complex structures like organoids that can show all the different layers of the retina in a single 3D cell culture can be transplanted on block. So, find, so essentially what you can say is just like in gene therapy, once you've developed your cell stem cell type, the cell type you want to transform that into, the format and a delivery method, you can have some type of stem cell therapy. And a uh, quick um, uh, uh, two studies from London as well as California were published uh, in 2018, showing that you can have sheets of e uh, embryonic stem cell derived RPE transplanted subretinally uh, in a safe manner. And then uh, a group from Japan also demonstrated that you can use IPSC to derive RPE, which uh, has also been transplanted in one patient in Japan. Um, so in summary, uh, gene replacement uh, is great for recessive diseases. Um, not newer generations of AAV and newer ways of delivering those vectors are being developed. Gene editing is great for dominant diseases and for ablating or de uh, destroying a gene, uh, but off-targeting could be some concern. And then stem cell has the potential for any advanced diseases, um, and uh, the, most of those studies are still in the pilot stage, so safety and biocompatibility will still be a question for the future. So that was my attempt to do this in 10 minutes. <laughs>